Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero. It's been a while since the last time I reviewed a video game, so this time I'll be taking a look at one of the more recent titles from Shinji Mikami, creator of the Mega Man series, which has recently come up on the Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you've been watching those. Specifically, I'm taking a look at Vanquish. The story begins with San Francisco being attacked by a microwave heat ray with a massive body count. The attack wasn't caused by the kill side of some evil mastermind, but from one of the U.S.'s own space habitats, which has been commandeered by the Russian government, which has, naturally, turned evil again, and is using the microwave transmitter meant to, I presume, transmit electricity from space to Earth, as a super weapon. On the one hand, I, this is kind of a clever idea. Most of the times in speculative fiction, when we get to these kind of space colonies, we don't get into the economic justification for the space colonies or how they pay for themselves aside from needing to relieve overpopulation pressures on earth it's not like a space colony is natural resources that can be mined to fill to feed into some sort of um colonialist system like with the U u.s and or north america and how that fit into the european colonial system and mercantilism and all that go watch crash course but there is one natural resource that is plentiful that space colonies could theoretically extract. Power. Simply solar energy. Depending on how solar technology had advanced and what interior um, solar collection systems that would be not just solar collection, but also power generation systems inside of the... Um, colony theoretically i mean this is probably the long term this wouldn't actually be viable i'm just pulling something out of my head based on my scientific knowledge but hypothetically you could place a space colony in a position where it can collect more solar energy than you could on earth um and then beam that energy directly back to earth using a receiving using microwave energy transmission to a receiving station if you played SimCity 2000 kind of what the microwave power generation facilities were that is, is something like that you'd have a satellite in orbit collect solar energy beam it back down to the receiving station that's also why when you had a disaster related to the microwave stations they worked the way they um, they're depicted the way they did as opposed to with coal or nuclear in, in game the problem is for this to work it doesn't but I think from an orbital mechanic standpoint in order to accurately beam the energy back down to earth the station needs to be in a geosynchronous orbit over your receiving station but in order to economically build the station and ha keep it operating where it's supposed to be you have to build it basically at a Lagrange point which actually if you've familiar with the series Mobile Suit Gundam. That is how the space colonies in the series are built. They're all built at the, at the various Lagrange points in the solar system. A Lagrange point, for those who aren't scientifically in the know, is a point where basically the gravitational poles and, and forces between two locations or several different locations equal out so you can feasibly put something someplace and it'll stay there. Um, there's still some stuff you have to do. It, it's I'm oversimplifying, but that's the general principle behind the Lagrange point. Though theoretically, with you build a station at the Lagrange point and did it that way, you could build a station with large batteries to store the energy until you can beam it back to Earth once you have line of sight to the receiving station with the microwave transmitter. And certainly, that would make much more sense than putting a big weapons-grade microwave death ray on your space station with no command and control options so that any psychotic asshole could take control of the station and wipe out major cities. That'd just be stupid! This leads to the U.S. launching a counterattack with a massive space battle with the U.S. Space Navy fighting the Soviet space fleet before... Wait a goddamn minute! Why not use those? You know... The spaceships. You already have the capability to build a space navy. Why not have them rain death from space on the U.S.? 
it'd probably be considerably easier and much less convoluted. It's not like you're shooting for plaus plausible deniability or anything. You give a I'm holding you for ransom like a Bond villain speech to the U.S. government telling them that you did this. Seriously, it'd be much less convoluted just to attack from space. Anyway, the U.S. manages to get a shipload of Marines on the station using the often underrated strategy of get em. From here, the player, controlling Sam Gideon, who works for DARPA and is the pilot of a prototype suit of powered armor that has rocket jets in the needs. Said armor allows Sam to stage slide across the floor and do bullet time, occasionally at the same time. This is an asset for fi fighting the hordes and hordes of robotic security soldier people that the Russians sent up to secure the space station. Why doesn't the U.S. have any of those? Unfortunately, the armor does not bestow the wearer with the ability to slide around, to stand up on a stage monitor, maintain perfect balance, and ask the city he's in to scream for him. If it did, then that would be awesome. Er. Commanding the Marines on this mission is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Burns, who has had extensive cybernetic replacement work done, and who also is in no way a mole or traitor for any sort of dark and sinister conspiracy, in spite of the fact of his constant insistence that Sam leave Marines who are asking for help behind to die in favor of continuing with the mission. One of the many mottos of the U.S. Marine... Uh, glitch. Uh, one of the many mottos of the U.S. Marine Corps is Marines leave no man behind. I found that out in less than five seconds of Googling. Just saying. This leads us into the meat of the game, which basically involves making your way through the space colony to the controls of the microwave ray so they can prevent New York from being broiled. The problem with this is, well, the game plays like Gears of War, but with rocket skates on your knees and robots instead of locusts and a incredibly bland and sanitized art design. In particular, in Gears of War, the environments in the game, particularly the cities, had a distinct visual style to them that said something about the place. There was a real idea that when these places were built originally, people gave a damn about what they were building. Consequently, we got the impression as players that if these buildings were in a state of repair, as opposed to disrepair like they are now, they would be attractive buildings to look at. We actually got, got a little bit of this in Gears of War 3 with some of the ruined buildings. Not so much ruined, but the... Uh, outposts we visit there. However, here in Vanquish, we don't have this sort of subtle environmental storytelling in the sense of designing the environments that the world looks lived in and says something about the people who live there. In Vanquish, the world feels like nobody really lives here at all. There's no environmental storytelling. Everything's very blank and very sterile. Consequently, it feels like nobody has ever lived in the space colony. I mean, honestly, the world of Streets of Rage on Sega Genesis felt more real and inhabited than the world of this game. So, after fighting your way through the station and causing a catastrophic hull breach um, in the side of the station, forcing you to leave the Marines to die in the vacuum of space, again, thanks to the orders of Colonel Burns, we discover that, well... The evil Russian government was in fact installed by the Americans who are trying to start a war to stimulate the economy. However, the evil government of evil that was installed by the U.S. has gotten out of hand and seized control of the station, thus forcing the U.S. to attack it in the first place, and ah, this is so fucking stupid! <laughs> Really? 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 Are, are you kidding? We have freaking space colonies, which are presumably sitting vacant based on the art design, and we need the economic drain of a war to stimulate the economy. Just give people tax incentives to live in space. Encourage firms involved in softer businesses like marketing, like creative fields, um, service, um, outsourceable service industries to relocate to space colonies. 
set up factories to pre at the core of colonies where the rotational effects would have minimal gravity to basic to do manufacture of substances that theoretically could only could be manufactured in zero gravity. They believe there's like there's got to be something. Probably at that point, they probably developed some medicines or something that you can only create in microgravity. But something like that. Heck, if my little fan rankery earlier um, f about beam electricity to Earth from space is part of the plan, do that too. You were able to build a space colony and finish it. From what we see in the game, all... Assuming that there aren't any people there now, all you gotta do is move people in and you're good to go. It's a fully functional, fully operational space station. So, there's a, there's gotta be a plan there when you built it of, we're gonna put people on this station. They're gonna need something to do with their time. I mean, you can, there are better ways to create jobs than starting World War Three. Besides, the colonies are freaking O'Neill Cylinder. The, and seriously, I can't emphasize this enough. The resources required to build one of them would, one of those would basically require the formation of a world government to handle the logistics and labor, along with the fact that most existing treaties involving the exploitation and exploration of tri of space forbid any one country from claiming space as a whole or portions of space as sovereign territory. This is one thing that happened with like the moon and making it so you can't so that no country could put weapon systems up on the moon. And honestly, if you're building a US only space colony, then you're violating those treaties. Unless you've dropped those out as part of the fiction, in which case talk about that in the fiction. This is officially the dumbest video game plot I have seen since Homefront. The only thing that makes Homefront... Alright. The only thing that makes Homefront worse is Homefront puts forward xenophobic idiocy in the guise of techno-thriller realism, while Vanquish puts forward the idea that this is a science fiction game, and so any plot holes and logical inconsistencies which the which the plot presents can be painted over with the argument that, oh, it's science fiction, which is about as dumb as a wizard did it. One of the reasons I review science fiction, speculative fiction books on the show, well, science fiction and fantasy, is that in addition to video games and movies, I also want to put forward the idea that science fiction stories or fantasy stories don't excuse terrible plotting. It doesn't matter if you're a video game either. Yes, gameplay is important. I get that. But levels of stupidity in the story like this don't interfere with the gameplay. They don't. They don't interfere with the level design. There are ways you can do this story, rather do this gameplay, this concept of fighting and uh, of fighting a battle inside a space colony without having to put in this such trappings of all this idiocy and stupidity. And it's not like good. Not like Japan can't come up with good ideas for for science fiction stories. I just mentioned Mobile Suit Gundam earlier in this video. It Mobile Suit Gundam is an excellent work of speculative fiction and military fiction. God knows there are still people in Japan who could probably think of a story as good as that. In Star Trek: The Next Generation, in the episode The Inner Light, an alien probe mind whammies Captain Picard and causes him to experience the life of one man and all in all of its joys and sorrows over the course of an hour how the probe did it why the enterprise crew can't bring picard out of this whole state and the techno babble justifying that doesn't matter because the story that picard is experiencing and becoming a part of is bigger and better than the part with the probe in another great science fiction series farscape we don't care about the rug constantly getting pulled out from under John Crichton's attempt to get home, home because there are other things in the story that we care about more. We care about uh, Crichton's interaction with his fellow crew members on Moya. We care about their stories and how John Crichton interacts with those stories more than we just, oh, we want to see Crichton get home. 
with Vanquish. However, the only thing that I describe as being bigger or better than the plot is the gameplay. The techno babble, the, the science part of the fiction, is okay. But the fiction part of it, the story behind it, is so weak and so shallow and so, so stupid as to make it so I don't want to experience it again. And actually, that's the key of a good story in video games, more than gameplay. And what makes a video game good is when gameplay and story combine, in my opinion. I mean, yes, I will play Team Fortress 2 for hours and hours on end. I'll play Civilization for a very long time. I'll play... I, I, God, I lost track of the amount of time I spent playing um, Unreal Tournament or Quake 2 Deathmatch. That's because the gameplay did keep me coming back, but that's because in most of those cases, it's other, it's either playing with other people, and thus the interplay with other people, and thus the contest of skill that goes with it that keeps me coming back, in multiplayer, or in the case of Civilization, creating my own story as I went through the game, because that's a gameplay design that fits with that, with, with that crafting of your own story, because no two games of Civilization are alike. When you have a game like Vanquish, like Diablo, like um, not like Diablo, like if you have a game like Vanquish, you have a game that's purely single player and which doesn't have the same degree of, for lack of a better term, emergent game. That's not even emergent gameplay, but emergent story that something like Civilization has, where everything is so procedurally generated and randomly generated that you can go through it several times and have a different experience every time. Like, literally, a different experience every time. Then, as a consequence, the story becomes important. I, as a player, want not just to have good gameplay, but I want a story that says, okay, I want to experience this again. Or if DLC comes out, I want to continue living and experiencing this world, living in and experiencing this world based on the story that I got before and the new story you're presenting now. That's part of the appeal behind Skyrim. Um, and yes, there are decisions that if you go back and create a new character, there are decisions you can make that will change things, focusing more on magic or choosing different um, narrative paths. And, but... Generally, most of the things you find in the universe will probably be in the same place as they were in the first place. More or less, that could be wrong. Or Oblivion, or other, or other role-playing games like that. Or even something like Sleeping Dogs. Great story, great game, I would, and that's a game where I would play through it again to experience the story again, because I enjoyed that story. With Vanquish, there's nothing keeping me coming back. The game has a scoring system for the levels, and it has leaderboards. But it's a situation where if you have friends who are playing the game and they're on the leaderboards, yes, you have a reason to go back and play through the game again to try to beat their score. But that's all you got. There's no co-op. You can't have fun going through the game on co-op with a friend to try to beat it on a higher difficulty, because you. There is no shared experience there. If you go through the game on a higher difficulty, you're only going through it, can go through it solo. And there's actually no unlockables. There's no unlockable character attire. There's no unlockable concept art. Hell, the loading screens in the game, which have information about the universe, can only be viewed in the context of the loading screens. You can't view them outside of that. After I beat this game, I was satisfied that I'd done it and that the game was completed. But there's no moments to make me say, I want to go back and experience this again. I cannot recommend this game for anything other than a rental. Hopefully, Shinji Mikami's later games will do better, and I really look forward to his and Platinum Games' next titles, and in particular Metal Gear Solid Revengeance, which I have not played yet. Next time, I'm going to do another book review. If you enjoy this review, uh, please click like on or thumbs up on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next time. <laughs>